Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is the House Healthcare Committee and the Vermont House of Representatives. I'm Representative Bill Lippert, Chair of the Committee. Um, welcome you to our afternoon of testimony. We are following up on testimony we began last week um, around a proposal from the Department of Public Safety in conjunction with the Department of Mental Health and to a degree the Department of Corrections, but primarily with the Department of Mental Health, looking at uh, a proposal to add mental health counselors uh, to the Vermont State Police system in Vermont uh, to help respond to situations that where the state police are called and the situation involves uh, significant or likely uh, mental health issues. I'm going to turn this uh, testimony, we're going to be taking testimony today, tomorrow, and having committee discussion on Thursday with the goal of uh, reviewing and uh, finalizing a proposal, or if there's any modifications, a proposal on Thursday. Uh, I'm going to turn the committee over to our vice chair, Representative Ann Donahue, who has been working to schedule witnesses. And uh, Ann, I'd welcome you to give a general mm -hmm. introduction as well. And then uh, I'll turn my phone off. And then I will um, have you uh, welcome our witnesses and, and help manage the time that we have. I think we have between now and 4.30. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is, um, we, we are on a very short uh, timeline. We, we were not um, uh, abreast of this issue or uh, brought on board and asked to take a look at it until just uh, really last week um, because it was in the Department of Public Safety budget, which we don't, doesn't routinely come before us. So, um, so we do just have a few days and um, I, I really appreciate people who are able to respond, to come to testify uh, today and tomorrow on very short notice. Um, we are going to really need to keep to our timeline, so I'll sort of be reminding people, um, uh, keeping testimony focused, because we do also want to have um, some time with each witness to, uh, to have the committee ask any uh, clarifying questions. So. Um, we're starting off this afternoon. We have we have two uh, individuals, um, Bo Yang and then Calvin Moen, and then we'll be having a, a half hour presentation by um, several of the different designated agencies about existing programs they have that in somehow in some way uh, partner mental health and law enforcement. And we'll have time after that uh, for questions uh, to that panel. Um, so. Um, very much appreciative um, of, as I said, the people who are able to, to come uh, this afternoon. And uh, if we could start with you, um, Borg, uh, if you could introduce yourself. Um, I think um, most of us have met you through um, uh, all legislative training. I'm not sure you've been, you've testified in our committee before. I don't, I don't believe so. So welcome to uh, House Healthcare Committee, and um, we would love your thoughts on the proposal that's in front of us. Um, I didn't didn't specifically reference, but some people have asked, "Well, is there legislative language that I can look at that you're looking at?" And and we we don't have any because this was simply a budget proposal, and the Department of Public Safety did do a memo explaining what their intent was, but there isn't legislative language at this point other than some temporary placeholder language that we put just to hold the money in the, in the budget. So uh, right. thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Lippard and um, Vice Chair Donahue for inviting me today and members of the committee. Uh, just for the record, my name is Bor Yang and I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And just quickly, for those of you who don't know, we are the state agency that is charged with enforcing the anti-discrimination statutes of the state, which includes our fair housing and public accommodations law that would prevent um, the state, nursing homes, other residential facilities from discriminating against people with disabilities, um, specifically people with psychiatric disabilities. Um, and I'll just get right to the point, as I know we are short on time. 
So with all due respect to the Department of Public Safety and their good intent here to embed uh, more mental health professionals within policing, I want to advocate that I believe this money should be moved from the Department of Public Safety to the Department of Mental Health for a few key reasons. Um, the answer to bias in policing against people with psychiatric disabilities is not to hire more mental health professionals in the same way that you cannot just hire more black and brown people to address racial bias. This is a culture and climate issue that needs to shift. When you embed social workers and mental health professionals in the police, you potentially create a conflict where these social workers and mental health professionals have to operate within that policing framework. To be effective, they must follow the protocols, the policies, and the procedures of the police. And the goals and missions of mental health professionals could become compromised in the services that they provide. You need separation. We see that with healthcare within the Department of Corrections. There's a culture and climate in corrections that permits, in many ways, disrespect for the dignity of inmates. We've seen cases this year against um, women in our prison systems. We've seen cases based on race and definitely based on disability. We know that healthcare providers who, out, who operate outside of corrections often have very different opinions about the health services provided for inmates by those who are regularly doing the business of providing healthcare within collection. When it, leaving this money with the Department of Public Safety means that it is used for one primary purpose, and that is emergency response. Diverting these funds to the Department of Mental Health entirely with the legislative mandate to develop more community resources and maybe peer networks means that the funds will go farther and wider and be more effective in preventing the need for emergency responses. It is time that we invest in being proactive and not reactive. The state of Vermont is in a mental health crisis. There are not enough community supports for people with psychiatric disabilities in the state. And on a regular basis, people who are aging with dementia and other health issues are stuck in hospital beds and they're stuck in corrections while they're waiting to be placed in the community. They have nowhere to go. Nursing homes and residential facilities across the state reject them. The state might provide incentives to help them be placed, but they are not held accountable or responsible for ensuring this continuity of care. We are leaving our most vulnerable in hospitals to die, and I am not exaggerating. We've seen these cases at the Human Rights Commission. In the best case scenarios, some of these individuals have to leave the state of Vermont away from their friends and their family to live in Massachusetts or New Hampshire or elsewhere. Um, sometimes they're awaiting for placement for up to a year or more. And at worst, while they're waiting, they die. These funds could be used to develop more community and residential homes for Vermont's most vulnerable. And a lot of these community resources that I'm referring to have already been addressed and um, made as recommendations in two really important reports. If you haven't already read it, I would refer you to those reports. One of those is a 2012 report to the legislature by the Behavioral Health Policy Collaborative. And that was done in response to Act 79, which was an act relating to reforming Vermont's mental health system. And the other report just came out in March of this year by Disability Rights Vermont called Wrongly Confined. And it goes through several findings and several recommendations. And so I would defer you to the experts on what those community resources are that are best fit to help uh, Vermont's most vulnerable. But I would say that while we have this money, instead of looking at it as having mental health professionals in policing is better than not having mental health professionals in policing, but instead to say, since we have this, what is the best way to serve Vermont's most vulnerable? And I argue that the best way to do that is to give that money to the Department of Mental Health to 
work towards building those community resources. So I thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Um, are, there, are there any questions? Um, uh, Mari and then Lori. Um, thank you for that. And would the, um, if we required the um, active participation of the Human Rights Commission and or the Racial um, Equity Task Force, um, speaking for your own, um, in your own jurisdiction, would you foresee needing some financial support <clears throat> in order to, to work with this program? Uh, the, as a state employee and a state agency, we, no, we wouldn't. I mean, it's just a matter of time and shifting that work around and we are pretty um, worked, but I, I, I feel like we're in the business of service. And so the answer is we would be gladly help. I don't know if the Human Rights Commission is the best entity. Uh, certainly we do a fair amount of these kinds of discrimination claims. But I would also say that it, oftentimes people think of the Human Rights Commission only because that's the agency that they know of. But Disability Rights Vermont is a great agency. A lot of designated agencies have experts that could serve as well. And so, um, yeah, that's all I would say. But to answer your question, no, we don't. We won't need money to do this work. Uh, Lori, did you still have a question? No, I'm good, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your insights. Thank um, you all. Good luck. Um, so right on time, two minutes early, it's great. Um, we have uh, Calvin Mowen, and again, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself and your, uh, your background and your uh, title and relevance to the topic and then just jump right in. All right, thank you, Anne. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate the invitation to speak to you all today. Um, my name is Calvin Moen, and I'm here as a trainer with the Peer Development Workforce Initiative um, in Vermont. Uh, as part of that work, I do a lot of training um, in intentional peer support, in uh, safely withdrawing from psych drugs, um, a whole range of things. Um, I've also done some trainings in the community on alternatives to policing in crisis situations, um, largely using uh, the IPS model and restorative justice practices. Um, I am also uh, an eight year resident of Wyndham County. I am myself a psychiatric survivor, meaning that um, I have experienced harm through the psychiatric system. Um, and I currently am also a user of mental health services. I am also a member of the LGBTQ community. Um, and for as long as I've been in Vermont, I have been an advocate um, doing direct support of individuals, um, both inpatient and in the community that are interacting with uh, Vermont's mental health system. And and I am, I'll say that I am opposed to the proposal from DPS completely <laughs> to expand the mental health outreach into the state police barracks. Um, I understand that it's, uh, I guess I will say it's, it would be preferable to me to have that be under DMH, but I also have some concerns about that that I will get to. Um, but I guess I just want to first say that I you know, I appreciate the proposal from the from the Department of um, Public Safety. I think it's a, a good faith effort. I think what it's proposing is that, you know, really to reduce the harm to people who are experiencing distress. Um, we know that there's a problem. We know that we need to do something. Um, in Vermont, the people who are most likely to be killed by police are those experiencing emotional crisis or an extreme state or an altered state. Um, and those chances are increased when there are other factors involved, you know, poverty, um, being black, indigenous, uh, other person of color, being visibly queer, um, transgender, gender nonconforming. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think 
there's pretty large agreement about the most effective and immediate way of reducing violence against those communities is to reduce our interactions with the police. Um, however, this proposal isn't going to do that. Um, and I guess I want to point out that, you know, we're in the middle of a moment where there's a lot of momentum um, across Vermont, as well as the whole country to uh, divest from policing and invest in community supports instead. Um, because we're recognizing that policing does often result in trauma, injury, and death. Um, and so this proposal actually does expand the reach of the police um, rather than defunding and investing in the community. Um, and yeah, I will echo that what we actually need is uh, greater efforts to extricate mental health supports from law enforcement. This proposal would further enmesh them. Um, the message I believe that is sent here um, is that mental health is a criminal issue. It's, it's a public safety issue. And, you know, as I have heard repeated again and again and again, and which Commissioner Sherling also included in this proposal, those with mental health challenges, I'm gonna quote him right now, um, are not more likely than anyone else to commit violent acts or crime. So as we are treating mental health crisis intervention as a public safety issue, um, we are really enforcing that myth that you know, we are violent and dangerous people. Um, I also wanna echo that what we really need to be doing is to be putting those resources into the community um, and working toward, yeah, like the ability to support each other without involving law enforcement. Um, police respond to these crisis situations as we know, not because they are best suited to handling them, but because people call 911, bystanders, friends, family members. Um, and they do this because they don't have any other alternatives or about them. And I wanna say a little bit about why social workers and mental health professionals are not alternatives to police. Um, they are just as capable of separating us from our families, having us locked up in institutions, um, getting court orders for us to be put under state surveillance as the police are. Um, and they're able to do it not based on, you know, a crime or anything like that, but just because of a psychiatric diagnosis or a disability. When a clinician arrives on the scene, um, to, to respond to a crisis, that constitutes an escalation uh, for many people who have suffered trauma from the system, um, whether it's in the emergency room, psychiatric system. Um, people have really seen great loss in their lives um, because of their involvement with these professionals. Um, and as we know, also the treatment that we receive in this system uh, is impacted by factors that I mentioned earlier, race, class, and gender. Um, and so if we're really thinking about those who are being most impacted by policing, they're also most impacted by, um, by the, the way that we're delivering mental health services and social services. Um, and I have seen folks often respond um, respond as if this is a threat because to them it really is. And the way that we respond to threats varies um, from different people. But um, when we've had, you know, when we've had these traumatic experiences of having our autonomy taken away and our ability to make our own decisions taken away. Um, that really does create a, a trauma response um, that, that I've seen just time and time again, um, whether it's in an inpatient setting or, or in the community. So yeah, I guess, you know, I'll echo that having the social workers be um, part of a, a team of police does 
yeah, it does have some scary implications that that's where their accountability is going to be. Um, and that that's, that's the policies, the protocols that they're gonna be uh, having to follow. What I, what I would love to see, and you know, what I'm recommending is that we look at the way that we respond to crisis um, in partnership and in communication with people who have the live experience. So I'm here today able to speak to you, you know, for just a few moments. Um, and I don't know how many other folks that you're gonna be hearing from who have this kind of direct experience, but we have been left out of this conversation, generally speaking, um, including by DMH. We hear a lot about how, you know, we to make these very urgent decisions now, but you know, I, I think the phrase that I keep hearing is like the mid to long term. So in the mid to long term, um, you know, those with lived experience are going to have more input, um, and we've been hearing this for quite a while. So what I would ask um, is that, yeah, if we're looking at five hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, that's going to go towards crisis response, and it ends up. Um, under the purview of Department of Mental Health, that there be a really clear directive about the kinds of decision-making um, processes that are going to, in fact, involve my community, um, ad advocates um, who are already doing a lot of this work in Vermont and can really speak to what it is that we need. And frankly, there are some pretty clearly outlined um, proposals for how we would like to see crisis response go. Um, those are out there. Those have been out there for a while. I want, I want to give a little time for any questions. So yeah, kind of got the, hey, are there, are there any questions for Calvin on some of what he said or we have, you know, a couple, couple minutes here to Nobody. I see some hands, Ann. Oh, uh, I'm not. Yeah. Why are they not? Oh, I'm sorry. I had to scroll up. I'm sorry. All right, yeah. Representative Durfee, David. I thank you, and thank you, Calvin. I just was going to follow up on the comment that you just made that there are crisis response proposals that have been out there for a while. Can you elaborate just a little bit on? that because I'm not sure that I have a sense of, of what that might look like. Sure, thanks. Yeah, um, there, there are some models that are out there um, that, you know, frankly, haven't had the chance to, to be fully funded and fully scaled up, um, where there are peer support workers who are able to respond to crisis, um, who uh, also are accountable not to um, a mental health agency, but to the people that they're serving. Um, specifically in Vermont, there's been a proposal not uh, in terms of crisis response, but actually crisis support is how I'm going to put this. Um, there's been a lot of talk about how we need to like look further upstream um, and prevent these kind of um, emergencies where police are being called. Um, so for I don't know, a few years now, um, advocates have been putting forward a proposal to expand what we currently have as a two bed peer run crisis respite, um, which serves the entire state, uh, to expand that into more of these respites, um, to be able to accommodate more people, to be able to go somewhere that is safe, that is comfortable where we are with people that we can talk to. Um, and that that would in fact prevent a lot of the escalation into having an emergency. And- uh, Representative Rogers. Sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you aren't finished. I, I mean, I just wanted to add that, you know, I, I talk to um, psychiatric survivor advocates around the state all the time and we have a huge list of ideas <laughs> of things that we would like to see supported housing, um, peer supports, all kinds of things. I just, my point was that, you know, we are here and we have a lot of ideas and we are closest to the problem. And so I think closest to the solutions. 
Th th thank you. And and can I just follow up? Uh, and I know that time is not unlimited here, but uh, and I, I mention it just because it's it's salient, top of mind, the um, tragic incident in Rochester, New York, that wasn't a recent incident, but it just came to light. And I'm, and I'm wondering if just thinking in, in that framework, if if the question before us, and I'm not sure that this is the question before us, but if it were to have in a scenario like that, the option of sending uh, someone to the site who was a mental health worker rather than law enforcement, would that be, you know, would that be a better, would that lead to, to different better outcomes? Uh, so, so that's, I guess that's, that's what, how I'm trying to, or that's the way I am framing. Maybe I shouldn't be framing this, this conversation in my own head, but uh, if you have a thought on that. Um, yeah, so is it better? I mean, maybe, um, you know, a, a mental health worker is not showing up with a gun and they're not somebody that can, you know, throw you in jail. Um, they are showing up with, you know, the full force of the system behind them that can incarcerate a person um, based on their disability, that can, um, you know, have them court ordered to be injected with drugs. And, you know, for some that might be considered an improvement and for others not. I mean, certainly we don't want anyone um, you know, police showing up and then it results in, in a horrible death. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a choice of either or, like either that or we send, you know, clinicians who um, maybe have an agenda of, you know, getting somebody to, to go into mental health services that they haven't necessarily asked for. Um, I think there's a third option and I think it's voluntary supports that are available to folks that we can go to, um, which we just currently don't have right now. Thank you. I think Anne is saying- I'm gonna move to the panel just so- Oh, sorry. Folks, no, no, go ahead. It's... Um, thank you, Calvin, for, for speaking with us. Um, I, I guess I, I'm hearing loud and clear what you're saying about looking to existing models and including more feedback from members of the peer community and survivors of the psychiatric system. And I'm also kind of trying to make sure that I'm clear on if there is a recommendation you're putting forward for the $500,000 um, and if so, that I'm understanding correctly what it is. So I don't know if, if maybe you can re-articulate that or if you want me to try to <laughs> articulate what I'm, what I'm hearing. Um, I can try to do it, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I guess what I'm recommending because it is um, kind of the 11th hour um, is that I do believe it would be an improvement if the funds identified were put into Department of Mental Health instead. Um, with, yeah, like, I, I guess I would want to see a really clear directive for how, um, you know, my community and other communities who are impacted are going to be involved in deciding how to implement this. And I would like to see crisis response be completely separated from police response so that if that 911 call goes in and it's mental health crisis response, that gets dispatched elsewhere. Um, it'd be great to even have a totally separate number so that people can call for what they want and get what they want. That's helpful, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony, Calvin. Um, so um, I asked uh, Julie Tesler to coordinate helping to bring, um, I think there's been reference last week when we heard testimony, there are um, a number of different ways that have kind of uh, emerged over the past even five, even 10 years in Vermont for uh, trying to address uh, non-police response to crisis situations. Um, so there's more than one. And what I asked Julie is if she could kind of pull together in our limited time, some samples, some, some disparate samples from different communities of how some of the designated agencies have 
uh, contributed to, to working on the specific issue of um, addressing a mental health crisis. Um, so Julie, uh, maybe you could introduce the folks that you have representing the system. And uh, then, you know, they've got about a half an hour to uh, share the different agencies. I think we have four different agencies presenting and, uh, and then we'll open up for questions. Thank you um, to Representative Donahue and to the committee for taking this testimony and hearing the different perspectives. Um, I think we probably agree with some of the previous speakers. There wasn't a lot of process moving, coming up to this, that this proposal came out very quickly, um, but obviously with very good intentions. And so we thought as Vermont Care Partners, it would be helpful for the committee to hear about the crisis response work we do. How do we currently collaborate with law enforcement? Um, what are the models that are out there now? Um, and um, take your questions. So we plan to move very quickly. We have actually five speakers. I was assigned four, but we ended up with five, sorry. Um, and okay. we thought- we just have the same amount of time to work in, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just quickly kind of present some, some basic information for you and hope to be done in half an hour. So we leave a good half hour for discussion. Um, I didn't keep my list with me, Anne, so I can start. I know the first person is Karen Curley. <laughs> I don't remember the order beyond that. Um, Karen Curley is the Director of Crisis Services for Washington County Mental Health Services. So she's gonna start us off. And if you don't mind, panel, I apologize if you can introduce yourselves as you go along. And I'm pretty sure you know your orders. Um, so if we're set to go, uh, Karen, why don't you start off? Okay, um, I'm set to go. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation to testify today. And for the record, I'm Karen Curley and I'm the Intensive Care Service Director at Washington County Mental Health. Uh, within our division are all emergent and urgent care programs, including the emergency screeners and the new mental health clinician, clinical position working with law enforcement in Montpelier and Barry City Police Departments. Our crisis line receives approximately 14,000 calls per year. Our emergency screeners are a fully mobile team and respond to emergencies at people's homes, in the community, at schools, and at local businesses. Our, sc our screeners work very closely with our, law, with our area law enforcement partners and actively participate in the collaborative training process established with Team 2. Each month, approximately 34% of all screener face-to-face -face interventions include law enforcement. We also have a new position established in August of this, of this year, 2020, in a collaborative effort with Barry City and Montpelier Police Departments. We now have an urgent care mental health clinician who works 50% of her time with Barry City Police Department and 50% of her time with the Montpelier Police Department. Her position is based out of the police station. The position is funded by each of the cities in the Department of Mental Health. Since mid-August, this clinician has already been on several calls each day with the police to help provide support and de-escalation during emergency calls. For both the screeners and our new police urgent care mental health clinician, we are clear about the roles and responsibilities of each entity while jointly responding with law enforcement. We have established the mental health clinicians are on scene to provide mental health assessment, crisis stabilization, de-escalation, social and emotional support, and safe disposition planning. We are also clear law enforcement is on scene to provide safety and security for everyone involved. It is also clearly established that while we work respectfully and collaboratively together, we have different roles and we work for different agencies as well as have different supervision. This clear understanding and organization of roles during a response helps us to ensure the best possible intervention for people in distress. In Washington County, we have two screeners on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the entire county. The screeners are often called in multiple directions during their shift and have been increasingly needed in the hospital emergency department. For example, one screener can be responding to a situation in Cabot, while our other screener is in Barrytown at another scene. While the screeners are responding to these crises, Vermont State Police could then call needing a screening response in Moortown. 
In this situation, the screener will collaborate with Vermont State Police to establish a response as soon as possible. It is also possible that the screener's response will be delayed because they are already out on other calls. By having a mental health urgent care clinician working directly with a police department, they can respond to the scene at the same time. We need additional resources for mental health response. Our screeners are faced daily with innumerable demands for mental health crisis response from law enforcement, the community, and our hospital emergency department. During the COVID pandemic, we have had to develop new protocols to both incorporate telehealth in our response, as well as to utilize safe protocols for active outreach to help people in distress. With additional urgent care clinicians based with law enforcement, they will be able to respond to scenes directly with the police, which will decrease response time. Our system also needs additional resources for programs outside of emergent and urgent care, so we can refer to these resources for ongoing support and intervention. Currently, programs carry waiting lists and are saturated, which makes access to services more challenging. This increases the likelihood that people will remain in crisis. Our mental health system needs better resources across the continuum for prevention, ongoing treatment, support, and crisis response. We have seen a rise in utilization of the hospital emergency department and have people boarding daily with mental health needs at Central Vermont Medical Center. COVID has increased numerous stressors for people, including health concerns, financial concerns, family conflict, additional caretaking burdens, and isolation, to name a few. This has increased people's depression, anxiety, and mental health distress. Our mental health system is overwhelmed with service requests and needs. In emergency services, that translates to people boarding in emergency departments for days awaiting safe disposition plans. We have effective strategies based on research and evidence to be helpful to people in mental health crisis. We need adequate funding to implement those strategies and help people in distress. In closing, I'll share two stories that are emblematic of the different emergent and urgent mental health clinicians collaborating with law enforcement to make a difference in our community to help people in distress. Recently, our police urgent care clinician responded to a local bank with police. The police received the 911 call because there was a woman at the bank causing a disturbance. Our urgent care clinician was able to provide support for the bank teller who was visibly shaking, crying, and distressed. Our clinician was then also able to provide support and de-escalation to the woman who was agitated, experiencing psychosis, and also in distress. While talking with our clinician, she was able to calm, leave the building safely, and accept referrals to community resources. Another example of our joint response with law enforcement is our screeners responding to a home with local law enforcement where a person was suicidal with a loaded gun in their home. The screener spoke with the person on the phone while the police kept everyone involved safe. The screener was able to convince the person to safely give police their weapon and come out of their home. The screener then talked with the person and they agreed voluntarily to go to the hospital and get treatment to alleviate their distress. These jobs are challenging and stressful, but always incredibly worthwhile. It is imperative that we work together with our law enforcement partners to provide the best response in crisis de-escalation for people in distress and need. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, you know who you are? I do know who I am. Thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Brandi Littlefield and I'm the Assistant Director of First Call for Chittenden County and I oversee the Community Outreach Program. While the community outreach team works closely with law enforcement and first responders, they work across all community settings and our Howard Center employees. Our efforts allow us to provide proactive support while also providing support that will allow us to assist law enforcement or reduce, reduce and divert, my apologies, the need for law enforcement involvement. The program was created in January of 2018 with six local towns partnering with Howard Center. Due to the program's success in their first year, Another town joined the program in July of 2019. As, a, as the success continues, we have received much enthusiasm from the remaining police forces in the county wanting to participate as well. The program's success relies heavily upon hiring a varied group of specialists to better assist our communities. Our specialists come from diverse backgrounds, both personally and professionally. Additionally, the team currently has multiple members that are bilingual, and we value applicants with lived experience as it enriches the services that we are able to provide. 
In fiscal year 20, we provided 3,344 calls and 1,137 face-to-face contacts, reaching 567 unique individuals. We provided 186 proactive outreaches and diverted police response 384 times, which means that dispatch was sent out community outreach instead of a police officer to the scene after uh, verifying the safety of it. And then we've assisted police on 381 other contacts. The majority of referrals into our program come from law enforcement, reinforcing the collaboration and commitment to meeting community needs. Despite the significant number of contacts, we've been able to appropriately help determine appropriate hospital emergency department use. With only 91 individuals going to the ED for further assessment, 10 of those individuals were due to medical needs only, 53 were for psychiatric needs, and then 28 required both um, medical and psychiatric care. And we wanted to end with sharing a story of how somebody becomes engaged in our service. We had a 78-year-old female in one of our participating towns who was contacting the police department via phone and emailing the chief of police up to seven days a week. Her concerns surrounded neighbors' dogs barking, family, medical wellness, and isolation. The team followed up with her and explained the limits of what the police could assist with and asked that she contact us instead so that we could help her find resolutions. We informed her of the resources that could assist her and asked that she contact us instead of the police as she needs assistance with these individual items that she had brought forward so that we could help connect her to the correct resources. She has since accepted continued check-ins from the team and though she was previously refusing to engage in services, she has now, now accepted an intake with our access and intake team for transitional case management and support. She has not called the police department in a week now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thank you for having us. I am Charlotte McCorkle, a licensed clinical social worker and the senior director of client services at Howard Center, where I have worked since 2008. As the largest social service agency in Vermont with 1500 employees and more than 8,000 clients, Howard Center has an array of crisis services. So the community outreach program that Brandy just spoke about is one of seven crisis programs we have in total all of which interface regularly with law enforcement. Howard Center's 24 seven mobile crisis team is called First Call for Chittenden County. First Call has 24 master's level crisis clinicians and six supervisors. First Call provides phone support and face-to-face -face crisis assessments, now also by telehealth, in homes, schools, police departments, in the emergency department, and in other parts of our Chittenden County community. The police call first call for mental health assessment if someone they are with is in crisis and first call initiates contact with the police when there is concern about personal and public safety. Howard Center has two residential crisis stabilization programs. Jarrett House serves youth ages five to 13 and ASSIST serves adults. Both programs are short term in nature at longest 10 days and provide safety, further assessment, and connection to services. Act one is our public inebriate program and bridge is our five day social detox program where individuals can detox safely from alcohol and other substances. Lastly, we have two outreach teams, community outreach, which you just heard about from Brandy and street outreach, which serves Burlington with four outreach specialists down to six, down from six due to budget shortfalls. Street outreach has been a model for similar programs throughout the country. Both outreach teams are able to respond to community members in lieu of the police when the situation does not warrant a law enforcement response based on police and dispatches assessment and trust in our outreach teams. When an individual or family is in crisis, street outreach and community outreach can be the early intervention, eyes and ears to determine what level of support is needed next. A first call assessment connection to additional community resources, and at times, a visit to the emergency department. By having a layer of triage and intervention, both first call and the emergency department are not the default responses for community members in situations that don't require a mental health assessment or an ED visit. This is better care for clients and a more effective use of resources. There are times when Howard Center's crisis teams rely on law enforcement to complete a duty to warn when there is a threat to public safety, to serve a mental health warrant when a person needs emergent and urgent care, 
to respond when a client has a weapon and is directly threatening someone and beyond the staff's ability to manage safely. There are other times when we know that more robust crisis services would reduce the need for law enforcement. A few weeks ago, I had to call the police myself when a youth was assaulting staff at Jared House and de-escalation and intervention strategies were not working. We wished we had a viable alternative. Howard Center is in the process now of convening a work group to explore intervention alternatives so that we have the right resources and right services at the right time for clients and our community. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm, I'm Steve Brewer. I'm with Northwestern Counseling and Support Services, which is a designated agency serving Franklin and Grand Isle counties. In terms of the model in our region, for the last five years, we have had two full-time staff working together in two different law enforcement agencies. For the past four years, one has been assigned full-time to the St. Albans State Police Barracks. The other is assigned full-time to St. Albans City Police. Both have similar roles, which are modified to meet the demands of each law enforcement agency. They also provide support to Franklin Grand Isle Sheriff and the Swanton Police Department when needed. Our core crisis team also provides support during a response and is a backup support when our dedicated mobile outreach staff is not available. Um, we also, in the state police position, we've also been piloting a service dog option, which is really found to be very helpful on the scene. And um, the dog is also trained to track when individuals are lost and to um, assist in different ways. Our funding has um, been exclusively used through our crisis budget, our existing Act 79 funds which are intended to um, divert use of the emergency department, decrease inpatient hospitalizations, suicide, and also improve response and outcomes with law enforcement. Perhaps one way to provide a picture of the application of our model is to describe three situations or a few situations where, with law enforcement. Just recently, we were involved in a response to a, a young adult who was on the top of a building structure wanting to jump. And in this instance, the law enforcement officer actually did a very good job of connecting with the individual and our person on scene helped figure out what, what that person needed in the moment and ultimately prevented a hospitalization. The, another area where we work closely with the sheriff is when, um, and I know this has been an area of focus for the Vermont Mental Health Crisis Response Commission, is when there is an eviction process underway with someone with mental health issues, and us getting involved proactively and not waiting until um, a situation escalates. Um, those are two situations. And then we also were recently on the scene of a recent shooting um, involving a, a homo an alleged homicide and being there for both kids and adults and trying to link them with necessary services. What have we learned? We've learned that having a full-time person dedicated to one particular law enforcement agency really does accelerate trust and connection and frankly challenging individuals and some of the assumptions they make about individuals with mental illness. Um, it also supports a more immediate access to mental health professionals. We prefer this rather than spreading one staff across several locations. We have also seen the benefits of the Team 2 training model designed to support both law enforcement and mental health providers in figuring out how to respond more proactively and effectively and to learn from each other before this is a cr the crisis gets out of hand. This also supports the goal of uh, developing a response together with law enforcement and mental health, both having different knowledge and skills and collaboration. The important point in supporting funding for a position through a designated mental health agency is that you are not just purchasing a person, but purchasing a system that can be coordinated and can connect with other essential services for the individual who has a specific need. In terms of the future, we're really excited about the possibility of funding to support these positions and could also see ways to enhance the model um, frankly, it's been frustrating that we've been using crisis dollars exclusively to support both positions. Um, we really could use these dollars, our existing dollars, in a different way to support other needs in our community. We also see opportunities how to enhance, how to enhance our services as well. I think another area that we're all challenged with is what's the best kind of data to get to understand are we effective in terms of how do we show better outcomes? What really are those key variables? So with that, I'll, I'll end my, my comments. Thank you. There we go. Um, can you all hear me? 
Great. I'm uh, for the record. I'm George. Uh, there. I'm saying you sound good. We hear you, and I'm muted. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's funny. Oh my! I know Zoom. It's, a, it's such an interesting phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, I am George Karabakakis. I'm the CEO of uh, HCRS Healthcare and Rehabilitation Services, and we're the designated community mental health agency serving Wyndham Windsor counties. So uh, thank you for, for having us here. And, um, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with, uh, you know, we have uh, since uh, 2003, we've had uh, a police social work program uh, starting in Bellows Falls. Uh, since then, because it was so uh, successful, uh, we took that program and brought it to Brattleboro, uh, continued in Bellows Falls, went up to Springfield, Windsor. Uh, it's serving uh, Weathersfield uh, to some degree, uh, Hartford. Uh, we also have a, um, a police social work liaison in the Westminster barracks that uh, serves about uh, 26 towns over 1,200 square miles. Uh, we also recently, through a HRSA grant, Health Resource Services Administration grant, have a, um, a police social work liaison serving the Wyndham, Wyndham County Sheriff's Department, the Dover and the Wilmington Police Department. So we've been doing this for a pretty long time. And uh, this program has really been about uh, addressing uh, the, the reality that uh, Unfortunately, law enforcement is oftentimes the first stop when there are challenging situations that are in our community, uh, mental health, substance use, domestic violence issues, uh, a whole range of behaviors that often lead to officer, to law enforcement being called, situations that actually involve poverty and a whole range of other issues, homelessness and healthcare issues and so forth and so on. And so, uh, so we, our staff work side by side, have worked our, uh, actually part of our adult services uh, and, uh, and are connected to our crisis team. They work side by side with, with officers throughout the area and the local police departments. Uh, they uh, monitor, assess, support, provide de-escalation they go on calls with officers. Uh, there are situations where there are, are frequent um, challenges. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they do reach out to those individuals and to those families to help support them. A lot of it is helping to connect the dots. It's helping to make the appropriate referrals. It's connecting with people who have a whole range of social service needs, but quite honestly don't know where to go. And we know the criminal justice system is not the way to do it. It's not support uh, that they need. What they need is help. What they need is connection. What they need is building those relationships. And oftentimes the work, it's in the community, it's in homes, it's at someone's uh, breakfast table, it's having coffee in their home, it's working out and understanding what those connections are. So we have in the past year, We've uh, impacted 888 adults, about 189 children and families were also impacted. Uh, we work with a lot of folks that are either homeless or at risk of homelessness. Uh, so our uh, police social work liaisons have been working with, uh, with warming shelters, with uh, the local shelters, uh, more recently with motel, you know, with folks that are in motels and trying to help support them uh, to connect with services. Uh, so, um, and in many cases, it's really finding alternatives, finding other ways to support those individuals. The intent is to reduce the incidents that lead to contact with law enforcement, but also help people connect with their community. Uh, one of the things that we've been uh, that you know I, I I have to say I really resonate with is that when we a lot of the work that we've been doing is trying to uh, really look at our systems, look at uh, policing 
and looking at new at ways to really move to a, a really a, to a different place. I think including peers, and and I I do feel very strongly that the people that are most impacted must be involved in the process. They really do need to be included. And I think we need to make sure that that is some that is incorporated into into our model. And I know that's something we're working on locally. Uh, so, um, you know, I, there was also uh, someone mentioned uh, proactive and a lot of this is really trying to interrupt that cycle uh, that just uh, isn't terribly helpful and, and breaking that cycle is really critical. So doing the kind of proactive early intervention work is really, uh, is really critical. Uh, as well. So um, though that's our something about our programs. We've, I have to say we've learned a lot. Uh, we've also learned that we as a designated agency uh, cannot do this alone. We are part of a whole social service network. So the challenges and the issues of the people we serve must be addressed holistically with whether it's through healthcare, whether it's through dealing with food insecurity and, and poverty and housing issues and really giving people those opportunities. So those uh, liaisons uh, really do an incredible work and are very connected to all our services, children's, uh, children, youth and family services uh, and all the thing, you know, all the, the comprehensive system that we, that we do provide. Um, uh, another piece that they do, uh, that they've been doing for years, is working with truancy work groups and working with schools. Because, uh, I mean, one situation we had a family that had three kids. Uh, each one was in an elementary, was one was in middle school, and one was in high school. And the school system didn't know that they were all truant at the same time. We went in, we supported that family, and we found there was a whole range of issues and supports and services that were needed that not only helped the parents who were having some pretty significant challenges, were about to be evicted. I, I don't, without going on into all the details, it was, it was a real challenge, but no one knew until that liaison went in to support that family and, and, and those kids. So uh, I think it's an important move. I think it's really critical that we create those collaborations, but that we also use this opportunity to move forward and really look at ways to create alternatives that can really make a difference in the lives of, of all the people we serve, of which we are a part of. So that's, uh, that's it. George, you guys have done a terrific job in giving some very succinct, helpful um, pictures. Um, I actually would like to start off with one question, which really um, is for any of you, because it, it, it's not something that really came up. And that's in terms of the various funding streams. Um, and there were a number of references to Act 79 or other um, Department of Mental Health crisis funds. And I'm wondering, are any of those funds based on how they're being routed, are any of those um, matched with federal money through global commitment or so forth? Not in my area, Ann. Okay. I don't believe so either for us, NCSS. So does anybody know why, um, if it's coming, if it's department, if it's mental health services money for crisis services, um, and, and this may be a question for DMH, I'm starting to sense. George? Did... Uh, it, it could be, uh, but I'll also say from our perspective, well, when, I, when we started this program, we patched it together with at least half a dozen uh, funding sources, including United Way and local funding. But as we move forward, uh, Act 79 was helpful, but ultimately we've been using uh, global, uh, primarily global commitment dollars. Uh, so we have been using dollars out of our grant and or global commitment pot uh, for this uh, program because we organizationally, we feel it's really important and critical. 
and yet it really it takes away from our ability to to fund other core services. So, but that's how we've been doing it. But again, I think that would be a good DM you know question for DMH as well, systemically. Um, other questions? Let me see. Uh, Representative Chena. Thanks. Um, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I have a, a question. Um, I asked this last week um, of, of the com commissioner of public safety. Is that Mike Sherling's title? He's a commissioner. Yeah. yeah. We were talking about um, how when he was the police chief in Burlington, how he was police chief when um, the Howard Center started working with the police department and had uh, social workers who actually like had were based in the station and um, you know at, at least for some time and he didn't know the current status of that partnership so I'm curious like are, are not just for the Howard Center but for any for these designated all the designated agencies present if people could talk a bit about um, challenges that might emerge from having police embedded in the police stations for them as mental health workers because we heard some testimony I'm assuming you all heard from the Human Rights um, Commission earlier, um, as well as from Calvin. I don't, I don't remember your organization, Calvin Moen. Um, but some concerns um, about embedded ab about it from the perspective of clients. And I'm just curious, as the actual agencies, um, had there been any challenges um, having workers embedded in police departments? And for the Howard Center specifically, does that are there are they still cited at the police department? Uh, I can speak to that. This is Charlotte McCorkle. Thank you for the question. Um, you'll notice that none of us use the word embedded. We think it's complicated and potentially misunderstood. So all of the staff that we spoke of across our agencies are hired by the, the, the designated agency. And so for Howard Center, our four Burlington Street Outreach staff are hired by Howard Center and they have an office in downtown Burlington right off of Church Street and are frequently at the Burlington Police Department just like they're at other um, community locations downtown, but they don't work out of the police department specifically. Would it be fair to say that like an analogy would be how, I mean, I work for First Call, so in full disclosure to all the other designated agencies here, I mean, Charlotte and Brandy know this, but <laughs> so, so First Call workers work in the hospital, but we're not, we're not based there. So we'll go to the emergency room, but we're at our actual, and we have a workroom at the emergency room, but that's not our main office. Is it similar that they have a space at the police station they can use, but they're, but that's not their main office? That's right. Okay. Did any of the other agencies want to respond to your models in terms of that question? Uh, George? Yeah, yeah this, uh, I, uh, no, that's actually a really, really good question. and. I, our staff, well, first of all, having, having staff uh, in, you know, eight or nine police departments, the sheriff department, you know, and, and, and the barracks, each, each department and each community has its own culture. Uh, it, it's really, it's, it's sort of interesting. Uh, in general, we are co-located. We have our staff are, uh, have a space. Uh, the work that they do, however, it might be, uh, you know, in people's homes. It might be in the community. It might be at the shelters. It might be at the warming shelters. I mean, their community is out and about in the community, but they do have a space. They are very connected, and that those relationships are key. The trust and the relationships are really critical, but just as important and more important is the trust and relationships that are built in the community, so that people that they have they come in contact with know that they are HCRS staff, that they are here to help support and guide people. And, uh, but it is, it is a, a process of sort of, un, you know, working on uh, sort of really uh, understanding each other's culture, but also making sure that our staff who are supervised by HCRS staff, I and mean, they're part of our, you know, on-site meetings, of course, and so forth. But that they, what they do is consistent with our philosophy of care and our values. I think that's really, really important. And I think that's, uh, it's gotta be part of the process. So anyway, thanks. And I, I would just comment too from Northwest Counseling and Support Services, we're co-located, more co-located in the state police than in the 
city police. But one of the nice things about that to build on what George and others were saying is that you can have some informal conversations about situations. I was, well, that would have been a good one to call me on. I could have really worked with you in a different way on that. And it really takes time to build that trust. And um, so, but I also understand that, you know, one of the concerns would be, do you almost get into this kind of collusion point of view where we're just, uh, we're not, we're not different and do we have the right staff who could call out certain things um, but we've seen some real uh, movement within um, some of the law enforcement officers and challenging their own views on some stuff and not fully understanding and frankly talking about things in their own families and trying to figure out what is a different way to respond there has to be a better way of responding uh, Karen is your hand up to reply, uh, sure. I'll go. I'll go really quick. So our our urgent care clin clinician position is new. What I want to say about the funding about that program, just or that position, really quickly, is we only have funding for a year. And so what I have concerns about is the sustainability related to will this continue to be funded after this year. So that person just started about four weeks ago and she is co-located in both the police departments and she also has two offices at Washington County Mental Health. So as everybody said before, really her job is to be mobile, her job is to be in the community, her job is to be an outreach person available to folks. The one last thing that I will say just to mention is um, law enforcement entities in our area, the hospital in our area, schools in our area, everyone wants a screener based in their building or entity with them related to response time. So when you have two people who are covering the whole county, we're, we're a tinier county than some of the other counties. It's still, if Vermont State Police is going from the Middlesex barracks to um, Moortown and I'm out in Williamstown, I'm still 20, 30 minutes behind them in terms of response. So that's all I'll highlight as well. Thank you. Other questions? Bill. I don't think I have a blue hand to raise because I think it's because I'm co-host or something. I was keeping oh. my blue hand. I can't find it. Um, so I would be interested in hearing uh, folks from the DA's comment on Calvin's uh, suggestion of a strictly or a primarily peer response uh, and to see if, because anyway, so I'd be interested in if you, maybe it's like asking someone to conceptualize something which is so inside your, the DA structure that you can't think about it, but uh, what what would it mean to have uh, uh, a strictly or a primarily peer response rather than even a mental health professional response? And can that can you can you comment on how how that might be structured or whether you could interact with such a program? Again, this is Charlotte McCorkle from Howard Center, and I'm happy to um, start. Um, I what Calvin. Uh, said really resonated with me in terms of the ideals of responding to people who are in need of support. And I think now and in the future, there are a lot of uh, things that he said that we uh, can put in place or strengthen. Howard Center does have a, a peer run team called START, Stabilization Treatment and Recovery Team. It's peer led and um, all the members of that team are peers. There is some criticism within the peer community about it because it's a peer team within a designated agency system, mm -hmm. which some people find to be a contradiction in and of itself. But our START uh, program, the staff respond both in crisis situations and also um, at points of intake so that all adults coming in for services have an opportunity to connect to a peer service. And that uh, START provides services on the phone, but also face-to-face -face and through a telehealth, so fully mobile in Chittenden County. I think it would be fantastic if there was funding for additional peer positions. Um, and this may be part of a longer conversation, but I think there are some situations where even with, the, uh, with a robust peer structure or the supports that Calvin was talking about, there uh, will be times where a law enforcement response is still needed based on safety. Uh, George? 
Yeah, I uh, no, I have to also say that I it really resonated with me. I do I do not the use of peers uh, as part of this uh, you know our response to situations that arise is uh, I think in no way incompatible. I mean I think uh, it's actually something we've been talking about uh, uh, internally. Uh, I would say a collaboration, a work, well, first of all, the thing that binds us, how does shared humanity, how does, how is it incompatible to have people who have had the lived experience, who really understand, who really get it, being part of an intervention that can support people in the community? That makes a whole lot of sense to me. Having said that, uh, I think that bringing that together with clinical expertise, bringing that together with resources that are out there, which quite honestly, I think we do need a whole lot. There's a whole lot of resources as part of a continuum that we absolutely do need. But uh, I think that it does make a lot of sense, but it takes a lot of conversation. I think we really need to uh, work towards that. Um, I know locally, uh, we have uh, a very, very strong peer support team. And uh, we've been having conversations around how to create those connections as part of an outreach team or as part of a way of, of responding to these uh, to uh, situations that arise. And I think like, like Charlotte mentioned, um, uh, I think they, uh, you know, I, 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 fe I feel like, you know, our peer support team, if anything, enhances our ability to support folks in our community. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I think there's a lot that I resonate with and I think there's some, there's definitely value there. Uh, and I, at the same time, I think the collaborations and uh, the relationships and the connections and also looking at ways that policing can shift and change uh, to really be uh, brought into social services uh, and investing in those social services, I think is really critical, makes a whole lot of sense. So. Brian? Thanks. I, you know, I, I don't um, want to go back to my question earlier, but I was just like processing everything. And like the, the issue, the main issue before us is this, is this idea of funding, giving funding to the state police to put workers based in barracks. And when we had um, the commissioner of public safety, he couldn't, he, he didn't have the answer to why the Howard Center stopped having the street outreach, I believe that's the title. It was, it, the person was Justin, who that was the staff person. He used to be based at the police station and that's no longer the case that that's the main office. And I'm just curious, is there a reason why the Howard Center specifically doesn't have people actually based at the police station, you know? And, and it, was there some challenge to that that led to that? And the reason I ask is because that's really one of the main um, areas where there's concern is this idea of, of someone working with the police versus someone working from within the police, you know? Um, so I'm just curious if there was any specific reason why or any challenges that emerged, because I, I don't know if we got a clear answer on that. This is Charlotte McCorkle from Howard Center. Um, I was not overseeing street outreach at that time that you're talking about referring to Justin Perrette. Um, I do know, like I mentioned earlier, that street outreach does have physical space in the police department that they're able to use. But I think as street outreach workers, they prefer to be on Church Street and closer to the work because most of their interactions are happening in or around Church Street or in the downtown marketplace area and not at the police department. So they, again, certainly go to the police department, but they prefer to be community-based. And I, so I think that's based on staff preference more than anything else. So I, I have a question. Um, and again, this is for, for anyone, but um, one of the things I'm not clear on when you're developing for any of these models um, seems like each time you have a, a uh, an entity um, that is more and more its own entity, there's less flexibility between them. And I'm not clear why, for instance, if there's the ability to add one staff position, 
let's say, who's going to be a liaison with the police, why that wouldn't be one additional coverage person as part of an, an, an enhanced crisis team, as opposed to saying, now we're going to have a separate person who's the, the police clinician. Because then any of those people, if they were all trained that any of those people could do any of those things, including a response with police, if there were two police departments who needed assistance or there were two non-police or three non-police, they, they could vary based on where the calls and needs are. Whereas if somebody's specifically the, the police linked person, um, it seems that that reduces flexibility. And so I'm wondering why um, the model wouldn't be to just expand the crisis service team and make it more robust. I can Anyone? speak in, in area. Um, what what happened in my area was folks uh, from the city of Montpelier and from the city of Barrie wanted specific focus in their area. And we're very clear that we are, our mission is to respond to all crises in our county. So yes, it would be great to add a third person to our response. Um, but it does not guarantee that that is specific for Montpelier or Barry, or for example, the Vermont State Police, when, when they have brought this forward to us over the years, they, they want a guarantee that when they call, you will absolutely leave your office in Berlin and come. And we've explained, it, if we're in our office in Berlin and able to respond, of course we will do that. But if we're out on other calls in other parts of our county, whether there are two of us or three of us, um, we still then are going to need to figure out how we're not going to get there at the same time as you. And so that's, at least in my county, that's the discussion of the way that this current position that we have came about. Thank you. Sort of, they're, they're buying a priority access to that person by having them designated and they're contributing funding for them. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yes. Yep. I, I would say that, yes. The other uh, agency that wants to respond, and then we have a question from Representative Christensen. Yeah, uh, and, yeah I would, uh, you know, the, the, the role of the police social work liaison is different than the role of a crisis team worker. Uh, the crisis team worker is doing, you know, the police social work liaison, at least in our experience over the years, is really focused more on that person, not that the crisis team person shouldn't be crisis team person, but really looking holistically at their whole support system, looking at the social contributors to health, looking at all those pieces that help support that, all the pieces that oftentimes are either the barriers or the obstacles, the things that are getting into in the way of people succeeding. It's a very, it is a different <clears throat> model. It's a different focus. Now it can be done differently. Also, our at least the the police social work liaisons that work with our <clears throat> our departments uh, are not QMHPs. Uh, they're not crisis screeners. You you may need to you can translate that for speak me. that out I, for I, everybody. Not, they're not QMHPs. Sorry, I, acronym alert. Acronym alert. Oh. I got it. Uh, <clears throat> they're they're not crisis screeners who are qualified mental health practitioners that are designated by the Department of Mental Health to uh, screen individuals for higher levels of care, hospitalization and so forth, warrants and all of that. So it is a different model. I'm not saying that in some cases, uh, and, our, uh, and actually in our case, uh, our police social work liaison at the Westminster Barracks is a QMHP, uh, but I just, you know, for full disclosure, but I do think that the focus of that work or like street outreach in Church Street, or I, I not to speak for for housing, but it seems like the focus is is different. So rather than just putting more money into crisis, you're really we're creating something very different. Uh, and so anyway, those are my thoughts on that. Anne Marie, I just have a woman on the street um, question. 
do people know who to call if they're in crisis? Um, the a lot of people wouldn't even know what a designated agency is to look up a number. And if you're in a crisis that's escalating, isn't it just the fastest thing to do is to hit 911? Is there a way your number, your crisis number is out there for all? Just question. Anyone? Well, so I'll answer that for Washington County. Uh, so yeah, it's a great question actually. And we work really hard to, through public relation efforts, through websites, through um, various and sundry advertising, and then also partnering with uh, other social service entities to get our crisis number out and about uh, through law enforcement. They hand out our number as well. So. I think, yes, we're, we're more than happy to have our number distributed, however, and there are multiple ways that it's distributed. I think it's a great question around um, people know to call 911. They don't necessarily in my county know to call 229-0591 for emergency services. Um. Uh, Julie, you'd like to weigh in on that? Just quickly, um, it is a challenge. We don't have an easy number, but we have been trying very hard to make sure that our crisis line gets promoted. There's been a lot of effort around uh, promoting suicide hotlines, but the crisis line is much broader. Um, and so we have been trying to put in the COVID support work and on the Department of Health website. and. Um, it, it, it's a challenge. Um, and I do know that I think it's in Oregon, when you do call 911, it can go to ambulance, fire, law enforcement, or mental health. And um, I love that model. Well, I don't know enough about it, but it, it seems like that is worth looking into. I, I did look it up. I had seen a reference to it. I looked up the website and it's uh, certainly an intriguing, um, seems like a really intriguing uh, positive model. Um, I'll also reference, I, I know that for some individuals who have dealt with the, the mental health system, um, the crisis line isn't interpreted as a way to call if you're having a crisis. It's interpreted as this is how you get the screeners who are the people who yeah. determine whether or not you will be involuntarily hospitalized. So it's maybe the last place you want to call. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, Anne Maria, is, is your hand still up or are you just? No, I'm finished. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple more minutes. If there aren't any other questions, oh, I have okay. A okay. Clarifying question to Julie uh, are, you, are you saying that there is a single number for a crisis line for all the DAs across the entire state? Because I'm no. not aware of that. We don't that have that. So we've been trying to publicize the connection to our each, website each with the links for each one. Yeah. 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 So and what I was going to ask, if we don't have specific questions, if any of the DAs would like to make any kind of final comment, we've got about uh, five minutes left to any, any wrap up thoughts based on the questions or things that have occurred to you. Nobody. Oh, sorry. Uh, Lucy, Representative Rogers. Yeah, I, I just was, as a quick follow up, I was just kind of trying to understand what would be required in order to have a call to 911 that was, that had to do with mental health be redirected to a crisis team or to the desert. I just am trying to understand on a very kind of nuts and bolts logistical level what would be required to make that happen. I don't know if anyone can speak to that. I could hypothesize, but I'm more interested in if any of the um, our panelists here could have any thoughts about that. Uh, George? Yeah. Uh, well, I do want to say at our local PDs, when if someone calls dispatch, and I know this isn't terribly science, this is just the reality, 
uh, when they call dispatch, oftentimes if it is uh, a, ch a mental health challenge or there's issues that involve that are sort of more social service related and so forth, they will uh, connect with our our liaison, uh, and there might be uh, oftentimes is a co-response. Uh, I also, I think, I think it was Calvin that uh, might that might have mentioned the possibility of a separate number, or really looking at situations that really don't need a criminal justice response. Uh, something we're talking about actually locally uh, is uh, in looking at health and wellness, or what some communities call welfare checks. Looking at those, looking at other. There may be situations where we could do that, but that would that that might involve a different number. It, it involves marketing. It involves really careful consideration of what are those calls and what are those situations where someone where it could be a, a whether it's a, a peer, a mental health clinician, a, a, a social work liaison I'm going to. But currently in, in most of our police departments where we have staff uh, co-located, they, uh, the, they will be dispatched. I mean, they will be connected. It's not ideal, but that's, uh, that's, it, it does make a difference and it helps a lot. Representative Christensen. Yeah, I, George, George somewhat answered my question, but when you call 911, they usually say, what is the problem? You know, that's their first. What is your emergency? What's, what's the, what's what's the your emergency? emergency? Right. And right. I would like to know, do they, if someone says, oh, I'm having a melt, somebody's having a meltdown here and they're getting violent, and, or even if they're not getting violent, they're just becoming totally irrational and it's escalating, I don't know what to do. Would they call the designated agency or would they, need, would they send that to the police? What happened in that case in our community that with the 911 calls, if we have, this is assuming we have a a police uh, a liaison there with the officers they will be called they will co-respond they will go with the officers the the, pro the challenge is availability uh, i mean there's a lot of challenges with that uh but uh and it's not it it's not an ideal system it's a system that really needs i, I think that's that's a much bigger conversation uh so it's uh anyway yeah lucy yeah, thank you. That that was helpful. I think I'm really operating. I or the question I'm asking is really kind of just a nuts and bolts. Where if it seems like there there's situations where the problem is that the person who's calling doesn't know the number of the they they should be calling the designated agency. They don't know the number of the designated agency, or they and or don't know that they should be calling the designated agency. I mean, is there a piece of equipment that can say? <laughs> you call 911 and at some point they say, okay, press four if this is a mental health issue and you press four and it literally, you know, I'm kind of very much on the, is there just a piece of equipment that reroutes a phone call? Like not as much in the theoretical, but more on the kind of like what's, what's missing to actually make that phone call go. I suspect there. before the mechanical, it would be a train, probably be a training and, and um, triaging, uh, component. I don't, I don't think they're trained to do that level of triage currently. That's my, my gut feeling about it. Um, Julia, we, we've got a minute or two left, literally, but Julia, just, did you have a thought responding to that? I did. Um, we do do the, this Team 2 training. It's a contract with the Department of Mental Health where train law enforcement and mental health center staff, but dispatchers are more frequently joining those meetings and so that they are starting to get that education. So that could help. Um, and I did want to be clear that we are supportive of this proposal. Um, we do think this will augment the work we're doing, but we also want to be clear that we would love to strengthen our crisis services and the continuum of services, including the peer component of it. And we totally agree that peers as stakeholders, just like we as stakeholders would like to be involved in a collaborative process in developing this proposal further. Well, thank you very much. That's a perfectly timed um, 
summation of the position and uh, appreciate everybody who was able to come today and participate and uh, welcome you to join in listening uh, tomorrow. Uh, we'll be hearing from a sort of a broader variety of people and perspectives. And uh, if, if we're really lucky towards the end of that time, we'll be able to start some discussion of um, people's um, maybe follow-up questions or um, where to start focusing in uh, what our thoughts are. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, want to close thank out. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll thank be back you. tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Are you ready to go off live stream? We are. Yes. Thank you.